Hello everyone and welcome back to our course, our course on commercial open source startups. We are in the middle part of three, uh, talking about open source software, open source projects and then commercial open source. Now after talking about the artifact uh, in the last session, meaning the software itself, we will now look at the process and the community aspects of open source software, now community open source software. So, as mentioned, uh, the traditional definition of open source is a legal one relating to the intellectual property that is source code and then open source code. So you got all this talk about the open source licenses and how they define what open source is. However, uh, in parallel to the evolution of open source licenses, there was a development of open source as a development method, as an approach to collaboratively and in a distributed way developing software. This process aspect of open source is often ignored or takes a second row to the legal aspects, but it's also very important. In fact, I would argue it's one of the big innovations of uh, open source next to the licenses. And this process is different from traditional software engineering processes at companies because again, it is by definition distributed, it's out there in the open, uh, has a peer review, has transparency of process and so forth. More on that in a bit of slides. Uh, and it promises a lot. Uh, most notably, it promises that you won't get locked in into a vendor uh, who might extort uh, fees of uh, uncalled size 4 from you. When we talk about open source software, again it's the artifact. Now, however, we are talking about open source projects, which is the software and the people around it. So the community of developers and users of the open source software. So the term open source project means the software and the people. And such a community, if it is a community open source, uh, has to fulfill certain quality criteria. It's got to be uh, diverse, most notably. So uh, the Apache Software Foundation defined this nicely. Uh, there needs to be people from at least three different separate entities, uh, either natural people or legal entities, who are not uh, not from the same parent company, meaning there is diversity and there's no single person at the end of some command chain who could tell the project what to do. The way open source software is developed in community open source projects is called open collaboration, which I define as you can see here on the left. Open collaboration is egalitarian, meritocratic and self-organizing. What that means is that Everyone can contribute, try. You may not get uh, what you're doing accepted, but you have a fair chance. So you are not, uh, you can contribute, which is different from companies where you have no access. Yeah? So you get assigned to a project. So you become an employee, you get assigned to a project, and that's it. People from the outside cannot contribute because they don't even know. And people from across the organization also can't contribute because it's not the project they have been assigned to. In open source, everyone can see, everyone can come, everyone can try to contribute, and if it's reasonable, you have a fair chance of getting your contribution accepted. As you might be working in a project, there are decisions to be made, and the decision-making in open source projects is meritocratic, meaning its decisions are made based on the merits of some argument. Uh, unlike companies where in the end there is a hierarchy of line managers or functional managers and it is ultimately uh, the status uh, that decides those who are superior to you can decide against what you want to. Now companies are not stupid, they will obviously listen to you and listen to your arguments but in the end there is a clear uh, hierarchy uh, and eventually your uh, your recommendation or your ideas might get overruled. 
do that one time too often in open source. Of course, there are project leaders who might overrule what you what you suggest, but do that once too often in open source and people will leave. In companies, they usually don't leave so easily. Finally, in open collaboration, the work is self-organizing, meaning the projects choose their own processes. So there are people who are there somewhat voluntarily and they will leave if it's no fun or if they strongly disagree how software is being developed. So the processes are adapted to the people and their needs and their strength. No two open source projects are run with exactly the same process. There are, of course, best practices, things that work, that get carried back and forth between projects, but every project can customize their own process. In a company, it's exactly the opposite. Your managers want you to have or follow that one process so that you remain or that you are that cog in the machine that is replaceable or because no company wants to depend on any one particular person too much. So this form of open collaboration is quite different from the traditional work and that is one of the big innovations of open source. They have been other ways of capturing how open source software development is different from other things. One well-known metaphor is calling open source software development the bazaar as opposed to building a cathedral. I don't quite know where the author of this, Raymond, uh, took that particular metaphor, but the idea is that somehow a bazaar is busy uh, small work, incremental, uh, no big master plan, while that's exactly the opposite for the cathedral. And in Raymond's uh, opinion, this is how um, open source software is developed. I'm not sure I agree, but uh, at least that book gave us some notable quotes. Uh, Linus Law, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. The idea here is that a strength of open source is that there are lots of users, many more than in a traditional setting because it's free, so it spreads more easily. And with a lot more users, all bugs are found more easily. And with a lot more users, there might also be a lot more technical people and a lot more developers. So not only are bugs recognized faster, they're also fixed potentially faster. So um, that's clearly an advantage of open source. It matures uh, with broad usage. It matures faster than uh, less well, less often used software. There are other things like in order to gather that feedback, you should release often, you should release early, you should release often. No surprises here since um, agile methods, for example, give us the same. The Apache Software Foundation, one of uh, the most important, one of the original early open source foundations also tried to codify or explain to us what open source is, though they call it the Apache way, so they recognize that maybe other open source projects may be different. And they give us uh, on their website a couple of keywords to identify uh, what that is, that it's collaborative software development, that it's commercial friendly, so they are not the free software people, um, yeah, the license is permissive, they focus or aim for high quality software, they have effectively a code of conduct and so forth. Um, it's a little bit of a laundry list here, uh, grown out of the practical experience though of one of the most important open source foundations still there are. So when I say open source projects now um, is what defines open source as well, not just the legal, not just the artifact aspect, but also the processes. We obviously now have to talk about how that process comes about, which is people. And so when you look at an open source project community and its processes, the first thing to see is that there are actually different strata or different types of people in the community, so you could argue they're sub-communities. And perhaps the most important um, aspect of it is that there's a subset 
which is the developer community, technical people who actually develop the software. And then there's a typically much larger user community, the users of the software, who, which may or may not be technical people, but they are just using the software, so they're not actively developing it. And that gives us a first idea of how development is organized because it gives us a basic uh, the, the words for a basic career ladder in open source. So first you may not even know about the open source project but then um, you realize you want a problem solved so maybe you search for some free and open source software to solve that problem and you find it and you like it and you become a user of the open source project. And as you become a user, you might run into bugs or have questions. In any case, you end start engaging with the existing community. Uh, for example, by asking questions, that's usually the first step. Uh, maybe even um, filing a bug report and so forth. These are small scale uh, contributions at a certain level, like if it's not just a question, but really helping others by way of a bug report or a bug fix or by answering in a forum questions that less experienced people might have. By doing that, you become a contributor. So you're actually taking a step from what's called a user here to becoming a contributor. And that is an advanced, more advanced stage in a career here than a user because then there is yet another step, uh, the step from contributor to committer. So let's assume you really like the project and you start making more and more contributions. And in particular, if these are code contributions to the actual project, so not just helping people in forums, but uh, contributing to the code base, then um, you may be or may get invited to become a committer. And a committer is someone who has commit rights, write rights to the code repository. So what happens is if you're a contributor who wants to contribute code, you submit it. You can't just put it into the code base. You submit it for review. And then an existing committer has to review your work and accept it into the code base. Now, you do that often enough and the committers get bored of uh, reviewing your work and waving it through. Hence, at some point of time, they say, this person is so good for a year now. All I've ever said is LGTM looks good to me and let, and let it into the code base. <clears throat> Why don't we give them write rights, commit rights right away? And if so, um, there's often a vote uh, because going from contributor status to committer status is an important step in each project. So there might be a a public or secret vote and um, and with a positive outcome then the contributor is accepted as a committer and you just became a committer to the open source project which means you are probably more engaged now even than before uh, hopefully your job pays for it or it's your uh, weekend uh, work so that's the basic career path from user to a contributor to a committer um, the roles uh, career stages, if you will, that you can take inside uh, inside an open source project. It's a very simple model. Uh, you can make it more elaborate because you can add more stages, more in between stages. A famous way of doing that, or a well known way of doing that, is the onion model, where you advance from the outside uh, to the core of the project because the committers. Uh, or the project leader among the committers are considered the, the core of it. So as you can see here, you might start out as a reader, then a passive user, a bug reporter, bug fixer, peripheral developer, active developer, core member, and eventually project leader. Though if there's only one project leader, then maybe you'll never make it there. The key thing is it's still three stages, just more fine grain. When you look at processes, you'll also have to notice that the traditional roles in software development, um, tester, developer, engineering manager, product manager, uh, these roles uh, are basically mapped onto 
uh, these positions that people have, whether they're user, contributor, or committer. Um, contributors and committers pretty much uh, uh, do all the development work and the committers are also engineering managers and somewhat uh, product managers. So we have these functionally separate roles of testing, development and management uh, and requirements uh, mapped into these comprehensive roles, user, contributor and committer in open source. Now then, uh, these are the people and implied in the basic career path with the difference between contributors and committers is already quality assurance because you can't just put code into the project a committer has to review it and often committers want to peer review each other's work so there's some little there was some piece of uh, quality assurance in there already by way of code review peer review but of course, software development processes are more complex than just one measure of, uh, of, of quality assurance. As mentioned, every open source project can be different because there's no big boss. Uh, the projects are self-organizing, they choose their processes, even though of course they learn from each other and often happily accept what works as a practice uh, rather than experiment too much because Unlike what some people say, who would argue that, say, open source is cowboy coding, it really is not. The people in the projects care deeply about the quality and the work they do. So open source projects often are of high quality, sometimes more so than traditional non-open source software. In any case, you need some understanding of your processes, even if you don't formalize them so much. and. Uh, and these processes are one aspect of open source project governance. Um, governance is a broader term, uh, so it involves the software development process. Do we do peer review? Do we have continuous integration? All these things. It also includes the roles and how do you advance, say, through the career path um, from user to contributor to committer. Also, difficult situations, can you kick someone out? How do you do that uh, so it's fair and you don't look like some dictator just took rule? All these things, that falls under the governance, uh, under the term of governance. And while again, every open source project is different, uh, there are probably three patterns or three coarse grain models uh, that have a name uh, that each open source project might fall into or under. There's the BDFL model, the Benevolent Dictator for Life model, pioneered basically by the Linus Torvalds and the Linux kernel. Uh, it's a hierarchy of people. The person at the top rules ultimately, though of course it goes down the hierarchy in a strong consultative uh, relationship. And the hierarchy also implies strong code ownership. So the people, the higher up in the hierarchy, the more the responsible people for that position in the hierarchy, the more code integration they do, the more code review they do, the more feedback they push down into the hierarchy to make sure things work the way they want to, and the less they actually write code. Linus Torvalds by now has still written a substantial amount of code in the Linux kernel, but I don't think he has the largest contributions. These are other people by now. And so you get a hierarchy and uh, the person at the top is hard to replace because they are the benevolent dictator for life. Uh, another model was pioneered by the Apache Software Foundation, most notably the core group of developers that formed around the HTTP daemon, the original Apache web server. And in this model, uh, you have a group of people who work together well, apparently, and who really view each other as peers. So there is no dictator among them. They are all equals or mostly equals. They are peers. And um, I think, and, and so an example is the Apache web server, but I uh, also always like the uh, Postgres uh, database, the RDBMS, as a very nice example of an open source, highly successful, long-running open source project that's run by the peer group model. Um, 
somehow the BDFL model has a fancier name and that's what people tend to go for and particularly if there's a single original founder though I suspect that the peer group model is more common these days than the BDFL model certainly with uh, more industry participation in open source and then there are other forms uh, duocracy once in a while shows up which goes by those who do rule <laughs> you put in the work in some sense you do get your way uh, I'm not sure it's always that easy but um, in many cases at least that's how they often start out uh, or they're short on labor people projects accept simply contributions and the goodwill of folks who want to contribute and put in work and the assumption is if someone does that they will act in almost all cases in the interest of the project and do the right thing so um, we've seen some changes here in open source over the last 20 years this is um, 10 year old work by now but I'm sure it's much more pronounced these days um, you can see when during a normalized day um, people put in work into open source so this is data from 2008 so it is old but again I don't think this has changed if anything it got more pronounced each line is uh, a day of the week and you can see and it got normalized into a 24-hour day around the world and you can see how during the night people sleep mostly how there is a dent uh, during lunchtime how there's a dent for dinner and maybe the only confusing thing here is that work picks up again after dinner you can also see how there's a big difference or significant difference between work during Monday to Friday and Saturday to Sunday so those who thought that open source is all hippies or volunteers uh, are obviously wrong uh, because most of the work you can see here is done Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and uh, when we took a closer look at this data we could see how there are really three categories of developers there are those who exclusively work Monday to Friday 9 to 5 uh, there are those who exclusively work on the weekend and then there are those who work all the time so three categories really and you can say can can map this into uh, simply paid for professional developers Monday Friday 9 to 5 uh, pure volunteers who have time for the work only on the weekend and then perhaps the enthusiasts who get paid for it and love it so much they keep working on the weekends and after dinner so open source in that respect is clearly driven by companies uh, even if uh, arguably it's the community open source meaning not competitively differentiating because everyone can benefit from it now with companies joining open source software development um, these companies pay the developers who contribute to open source projects where the code they write benefits everyone including their potential competitors so if you do that you must have a purpose that's we will talk about but also as you invest into an open source project by way of contributing to it on company time so company money you do want to make sure that nothing untaught happens to the project again uh, things that could happen to a project that you might not like is that you use the project as a component in your products but your product only runs on Linux and the project decides to only run on keep developing the Windows part hmm. so you wouldn't like that so you do want as a company which uses uh, open source software you want to find a way of how you can maintain your interests in it should be fair should be open but you do have a right and you want a way to maintain your interest so you cannot rely any longer just on a benevolent dictator who behaves how you wished they behave for that reason at some point of time then we got open source foundations 
where an open source foundation is a non-profit uh, organization which manages and performs the development of uh, a non-differentiating open source software, community open source software that's available to the general public. Uh, the idea here is that by incorporating into a foundation, you can have bylaws that clarify how to deal with the various governance situations and problems you might face independently of specific people. So by putting an open source project under the guidance or into an open source foundation, you reserve the right to overrule ultimately misbehaving project leaders. Almost all open source foundations will say they will never ever try to meddle, meddle with the leaders of a project, but should they go crazy, they can st still can, and that is good enough to, for the project leaders to usually stay reasonable. Um, members of an open source foundation can be natural people. That's the original one. Our Free Software Foundation, Apache Software Foundation, this, the members are natural people, you and me. But later on, um, open source foundations were created, like the Linux Foundation, which accepts companies, so legal people or heuristic people, as the members. And then it could become all kinds of companies uh, from the IT industries or vendors as much as service providers, consulting firms, even user firms as a more recent trend uh, join from outside the IT industry joining open source foundations to sponsor the development of software they need for the business. So the purpose of an open source foundation really is uh, manifold. The purposes are manifold. Um, for one, again, become people independent. Uh, actually, the developers themselves did not think that now control is being taken away from them, but rather that the foundation protects them. Because if there is no foundation, uh, they might get sued if something's wrong with the uh, software. The warranty disclaimer is not uh, not valid in some in some uh, jurisdictions. Uh, so in gross. Neglect in Germany, for example, can over, uh, overrule such uh, warranty disclaimer. So in any case, um, the developers themselves wanted a foundation to stand in for the project. Uh, so the foundation gets sued and that hurts the individual people less than if they got sued directly. They wanted uh, to accept donations uh, for the project and the foundation is a good way to receive them disperse them, manage the books, do the tax accounting and so forth. And uh, also, well, if, uh, if someone abuses an open source project, for example, trademarks, well, it's much better to have a foundation to represent the project interests than, uh, an, individual, than an individual person. From a company's perspective or from a commercial perspective, the foundation is supposed to create a fair and equal playing fields, field for anyone who relies in their business on the software. Um, the foundation is, should be very clear by way of a license, uh, by way of access to trademarks, uh, how uh, people can use this intellectual property. The license usually deals with the copyright, but um, if there are important trademarks associated with it, for example, the WordPress trademark and you're providing WordPress services, then you want clear rules for that. When can you use that trademark? And uh, you don't want that right to be taken away from you easily because then it would hurt your business. Uh, foundations can provide strong marketing for any services you have, but then access to such marketing channels needs to benefit all in a structured and fair fair way. Uh, you want a roadmap for projects if your product depends on these projects, say as components and so forth. So there are lots of reasons why you would want to put the governance of a project in its last step instance into an open source foundation. And perhaps the, the earliest example of a really well-run, user-oriented, uh, developer-oriented uh, 
Open Source Foundation is the Apache Software Foundation, gold standard, in my opinion, for open source foundations uh, on a generic level. And that's exactly what they say about themselves, that they provide an established framework for IP, uh, limits contributors' potential exposure, so they speak to developers, come work with us, we take risk away from you, and also delivers high quality software. Now then with the foundations, we get an enhanced career path. Um, why would you care about a career in open source? It's not in this lecture, but I have a whole this lecture or this course, but I have a whole lecture on what labor economics, how the developer market changes due to open source software. And the key thing to understand again is that all these open source components have become very important for the business of many software companies. So as these open source components and projects are commercially have become commercially important, it makes you, if you are an expert in some project and even have a status, uh, meaning being a committer, for example, in that project, uh, you're mo much more employable. You may command a higher salary. So then Thanks to the foundations, the basic career ladder on the left, user contributor committer, got extended with new, uh, with new um, uh, stages within the foundation. Uh, here, the PMC member, PMC leader, and eventually foundation member. PMC stands for Project Management Committee. So the Apache Software Foundation and others realized that beyond a core group of committers, you need to define an even smaller group of project management committee members. So a smaller group. So some projects have a large group of committers because it's large projects. And then the PMC, which defines the roadmap as a subset usually of those committers. So you can advance from committer to PMC member, where now you first uh, are not just a developer and a code reviewer, uh, but you also are more actively involved in defining the roadmap of the project and where it's headed. But also in the context of larger foundations like the Apache Software Foundation, the PMC more strongly is associated by way of road mapping with other projects in the foundation because Often these days, no single open source project comes alone, but comes with others, meaning they form whole platforms. All the different components by the Apache Software Foundation ideally work together. So you are not just in an isolated way are taking Hadoop. You are also taking the Hadoop file system and search and what have you. And these components then must work together and that requires coordination and that would also be a job of the PMC. The PMC has a leader, so you could be elected leader of the project management committee. So now you're really uh, uh, in person steering, not commanding, but steering an industry platform. And the Apache Software Foundation defines even and even more, even one more step, which is to become a member of the foundation which actually does change the job you're doing because as a member of the foundation, you're now a coach to other people, to committers, to PMC members, PMC leaders. Usually an open source project that is in the foundation here, the, again, the Apache Software Foundation gets assigned a coach to help them follow the Apache way, follow a proper development process. Often projects, important Projects that are becoming important join a foundation for sad benefits, but may have to brush up on good governance, the Apache way so that they get the Apache support and so forth. All of that may have been more important in the past. Uh, it's still important today, but the point is people already understand more easily these days. So I would hope that uh, the work of a foundation member acting as a coach to projects got easier over time. And so that's what I just described. Uh, the PMC folks um, 
um, uh, manage uh, the, the project, steer the platform, the leader coordinates more with other PMCs and the foundation member coaches. The foundation is also a great place again to manage the intellectual IP. I mentioned that so copyright pro potential problems around copyright are managed by a clear license and maintaining that license and not accepting license confusion. Uh, also often by acquiring copyrights. So the Apache Software Foundation, for example, acquires the copyright. So you assign I think the Apache Software Foundation actually only acquires a relicensing, right? Um, but the point is it can stand in as the copyright holder in, uh, in front of a court. Um, patent rights need to be negotiated and managed. Uh, the Apache Software Foundation does it very simple because they require or they used to require the Apache Software License, which has a patent clause, which then requires that Anyone who contributes also grants patent rights. Trademark rights are managed through the foundation and so forth. So foundations are a natural place to address and solve any issues around intellectual property that otherwise could become a choke point for anyone who wanted to use the project. And by resolving these issues, the projects become so much more attractive because now you have more legal certainty and more technical certainty that you will not run into problems. And also, again, while open source foundations usually will not interfere with the governance of the individual projects, they still can if things go really wrong. Um, and again, just that threat that the foundation might step in if everything tanks is uh, good enough to keep the project leaders reasonable. As we move forward in this lecture, I need to distinguish between two types of projects, which ultimately also lead to two types of foundations. So the original open source projects, say Emacs, um, for example, or GCC, the very old ones, they are really applications. They were by the by software developers for software developers but they were not components to be used in uh, in products they were really applications so uh, later we got uh, open source projects that were just components to be included in other uh, in other uh, uh, open uh, in other software sometimes open source software sometimes closed source software and hence, we can distinguish between projects that develop applications for users and open source projects that develop components for use in projects and uh, in products, which uh, are used by vendors as they put these components into products. This coincides with the use cases. So these applications or user which become user led projects are uh, developing software for in-house use usually while developer-led projects which develop components for use in products are aiming at the distribution use case and as a consequence user-led projects are often copyleft licensed while developer-led projects are often permissively licensed because if you want to if you put a component into your product as a vendor you don't want a copyleft license there so you look at a particular project and you look at what's the dominant use case and you will see is it an application for in-house use or is it a component for distribution as part of a product and by that we can identify either developer-led projects or user-led projects where those in the lead are the ones who determined or took that lead because that's how they use it for the business as a vendor or as a user firm. And that then leads to different foundations sometimes. So uh, an open source foundation is really just an umbrella. So it can have all kinds, it can have both types of projects un under the umbrella, though we find that 
because the foundation is strong on governance and the bylaws regulate how to deal with um, with the rules of the projects uh, in an overarching way, um, uh, we find increasingly that we have different types of foundations that match the different types of project. The original open source foundations, Apache Software Foundation, say they can handle everything, but they were clearly, in my book, uh, after the uh, after the initial application, you can argue that the web server is an application, though I think it's still a component. The Apache Software Foundation mostly developed components. Uh, now they took on open office. It's not a very much loved child, I think. So they have an application in there, but the Apache Software Foundation really mostly has developer-led projects, uh, developing components for use in products. Matches the permissive Apache software license well. User-led projects um, are, uh, uh, are were the original ones, then took a second step when the software industry came in, but now is experiencing a search as user-led foundations. And again, whether it's a developer-led project, I should have or could have called it a developer-led foundation, but it's really companies, so I made it vendor-led foundation versus user-led foundations. That's what we see as specializations, sometimes in one uh, open source foundation, but sometimes even in separate dedicated open source foundations. So vendor-led foundations are created to support developer-led projects. Uh, the Linux kernel, uh, the HTTP daemon, PostgreSQL, even a distribution like CentOS, um, something like Hadoop. Uh, these are projects, open source projects, that you can't quite sell as a product itself, uh, as an application. They are components as people build applications for businesses. And um, it's more, perhaps more obvious if I listed some collection library here or Apache Commons for common functions in Java programming or so. So these should be, not all of them are, the Linux kernel is in, still an early fluke, um, having created much pain being under a copyleft license, but in general uh, these are increasingly developed under permissive uh, licenses. And these developer-led projects, when it was clear, became clear that these are commercially important projects, they really, really um, should have uh, uh, led to foundations or to, to their own foundation or to foundations that were uh, part of an existing foundation but with dedicated governance. And uh, here you can see some examples uh, of foundations um, so uh, Open Robotics would be a good one, developing ROS, uh, which is a middleware, and that's about it. And uh, the Eclipse Foundation, um, after it stopped focusing on the IDE, it developed the rich, applic uh, rich uh, um, application platform. Uh, that's more developer components and so forth. The examples you see here are actually not that good. I think I made a mistake, but. Now that I'm recording it, I can't help it. So Node.js is good, good components and so forth. So the motivation is that the foundation and then specifically a vendor-led foundation or at least dedicated governance for a developer-led project creates a stronger and more competitive ecosystem as people are pooling uh, their resources yet everyone who uses is, is on fair and equal terms with the others who use it and contribute. Why, <clears throat> why is it important to create a more and stronger ecosystem? Well, because you are fighting over market share uh, with others. So look at uh, this simplifying example of, um, of the structure of a product on the left without open source. So let's assume the closed source component uh, 
that is Microsoft Windows. You need Windows to run your application and the price of the product, that's an application. Let's make it SAP S4 HANA or so. Now, in front of a customer, both parts are needed, the operating system and the business application. And depending on the situation, one may have a stronger position than the other, but maybe they just split the money to be made of the customer. Um, now then, enter open source. It isn't the interest of everyone on the left side to replace everyone else but themselves with cheaper open source because then the resulting stack of parts that constitute the solution from a customer perspective, um, the other parts become price compressible. So see if the business application provider um, can replace the open source component provider uh, say Windows with Linux and Linux costs less because it has less of a vendor lock-in, they are competing offerings like SUSE versus Red Hat, then the price of that component goes down and more money is left in the wallet of the customer who still receives the valid solution, more money is left to be appropriated, captured by the provider of the business application. Um, they may um, still charge the same, but uh, there's still more money left with the customer, so maybe they can sell more components or they can quietly hike their own prices. The key is that to the customer who does an ROI calculation, uh, the resulting functionality counts. So to the customer, it may, I'm simplifying, but it's not so important, uh, which components are there in the solution stack as long as the business functionality is there. And if any one vendor finds a solution to lower the price and it's under uh, their discretion how to lower the price, they can appropriate some of that value uh, from the customers. So that's why um, the software industry has a strong interest to avoid any monopolist that isn't the company itself and that's why we got uh, the software industry basically ganging up on the 800 pound gorilla which at some point of time was microsoft windows so linux clearly came about as a response it was a historic fluke but something people picked up when they saw that linux was a potential competitor to windows which would allow vendors to base their applications and their software on Linux and thereby keep Microsoft in, in check. So uh, anyone who was not window Microsoft had an interest of having Linux as an alternative to Windows to keep the Windows prices low or even wholly replace it. And that's of course other software vendors, SAP, Oracle, it's even hardware vendors. Uh, Intel was a big leader in Linux, still is, because um, there's more money for hardware in the customer's wallet if the operating system is cheaper or is open source right away. Another example happened uh, in the early noughties when uh, Microsoft Visual Studio was about to take over the developer world and IBM launched head first but very smartly big payoff into, um, into the creation of the Eclipse Foundation to build out then the Java ecosystem. So uh, today Java may not be that sexy any longer but back then it was the, the main alternative to C, C Sharp and Visual Studio and then through the Eclipse IDE. So the industry threw its weight behind, a lot of the industry threw its weight behind the Eclipse Foundation and the Eclipse IDE to prevent Microsoft from acquiring all developers, the hearts and minds of developers by way of Visual Studio. And today we see something similar where Amazon Web Services is, uh, uh, the industry is fighting Amazon Web Services by making at least the software stacks available that you need to run your own data center as open source, less so OpenStack these days, more Kubernetes, so I should replace that logo as well. Um, but with uh, Kubernetes, you can more easily run your own data center uh, 
and thereby keep Amazon prices uh, lower. It's not that easy because uh, clouds are not just the software, they're also the hardware, there are a lot of connectivity, but uh, it is an aspect of it that you can at least take the software equation or the software lever out of, of a uh, threatening monopoly uh, if you can turn it into open source. Things can go wrong in uh, open source foundations and vendor led foundations as well as some, uh, if you don't watch diversity, commit a diversity. Uh, but in general, again, if it goes too bad, uh, then the executive director of the foundation or the foundation can step in into a project and fix things. So now I just talked about vendor-led foundations because uh, even though the original open source software was applications, uh, I think, um, quickly the IT industry took over and realized that its components they want for their own use, most notably to keep uh, monopolists um, away from eating their lunch. So they used open source components jointly developed to gang up on budding monopolists. But in recent years now, we have, we see not a return to, but the growth or the new growth of user-led application, open source application development, which then also often leads to user-led foundations to support this particular type of open source software. Uh, again, you, we started out with uh, Emacs and GCC, and we got some applications uh, over the years like Blender and GIMP and OpenOffice. But right now, uh, as we see in a slide, in the last five years, other industries, but then the software industry realized the need for IT. Hey, everyone is an IT company supposedly these days, whether you're uh, from the beauty industry, logistics or whatever. And they uh, decided to uh, increasingly are deciding to invest in the development of, of open source software for the business um, as uh, through open source foundations. So that created user-led open source foundations, which is uh, dedicated governance, or it's an open source foundation with dedicated governance for user-led projects. Again, like with vendor-led foundations, you may not necessarily incorporate as your own foundation, but are a sub part of an existing foundation. But what you want is your own dedicated uh, governance. And that can be realized in many different ways. For example, the Linux Foundation, one of the Uber foundations, uh, uses the serious LLC concept to create a company for each project, which is still cut from a template for incorporation that lets those in the project, those that pay for the development, customize governance. It still has to be good open source governance. You can't suddenly turn it into a closed project, but you do get the flexibility of customizing governance for your needs. So an open source user led foundation then is an open source foundation led predominantly led by software users, firms who need the software for the business. It's the in-house use case. They often do not have the development capabilities, so they just pay consultancies, but they do define the roadmap. They do steer the development. And here are just a couple of examples. So these are actual uh, open source foundations created around one or two open source applications that people need for the business. And you can see uh, very strong here, education. Uh, so education somehow uh, was able to collaborate earlier than others. We know automotive, the car manufacturers are pretty strong because uh, they don't want the software industry to eat their lunch and they're sufficiently close to engineering. There are industries like beauty uh, that are not so engineering focused, so they are not here yet. But um, fin FinOS, that's FinTech, um, there is a fair bit of, uh, so there's substantial growth here. So FinTech, uh, education, automotive are the three leading main industries. 
which woke up to their need for software and how uh, it is open source applications they need for the business. So by sponsoring the development of open source applications and then still having vendors or service providers service them for uh, them, um, these companies, non-IT companies, solve a couple of problems. Uh, if in the past they used closed proprietary applications, they were at the mercy of the vendor and the lock-in they experienced into that vendor's software. So there was usually a fairly high total cost of ownership, uh, most costs being driven by license fees or subscription fees. But you also really depended on closed source software. So if there's anything you wanted to change about it, you couldn't. Uh, your innovation was really blocked because, well, you could not fix things. You could not take advantage of a market opportunity uh, by adjusting the software to fit a, or have a new business process. You couldn't because you did not have access to the source code. Also a funny one, but uh, products have very different lifetimes and durations of life. So um, train manufacturers, car manufacturers, uh, plane manufacturers, uh, these products, the products of these companies live for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years sometimes. And uh, you have an operational risk if you depend on a software company which goes out of business or is acquired 10 years later and the product is uh, sunset. Um, software companies have a much shorter lifetime, products have a much shorter lifetime than uh, the, say, physical products that depend on the software. And hence you have a high operational risk that uh, 20 years into the life of a plane, none of the software vendors is available any longer who provided you with the software that's still doing its job in the, in the planes or in the management of planes. In any case, the goal of the software user firms is to reduce that vendor lock-in by creating this community open source software and having a governance or by creating a supplier ecosystem for the products and services based on this community open source software that they need for their business and that follows their economic uh, needs. So um, what you get is a two-layer structure. The user firms sponsor the, the development of some community open source platform and then still usually turn to, if they are not IT companies, turn to IT companies to service any applications, uh, to service the applications and the use of said community open source platform. Now you might wonder, wait a second, they pay twice? Indeed, they do pay twice. So um, if Deutsche Bahn sponsors the development of some open source software for uh, train heads, then uh, they might uh, pay twice as they sponsor that original development and then as it comes back to them as part of a product. Um, but the total sum of these two uh, things they pay is still lower than if they have to pay for something where they are locked into a vendor, into a vendor's uh, software. Um, the key here is that the community open source platform by way of its license and by way of how to engage in that platform structures the key properties of this ecosystem. The most common choice I already mentioned, user companies in the driver's seat of these user-led foundations will almost always choose a copyleft license for the community open source software. So that vendors or service providers who use this software to provide services to the user firms, cannot create a sustainable advantage using com competitive advantage using closed source because the copyleft license prevent that. Hence, they are always on their edge and they cannot extort or extract high fees from the, from the uh, user companies. It makes providing services and products less attractive because uh, well, there's less money to be earned, 
but that is in the interest of the user firms, not in the interest of the vendors. So the vendors do have to think about, should I go into this market or not? Because other markets might be more attractive. So there's a give and take here in terms of who benefits and who. Okay, so after open source foundations and the two main types of open source projects, uh, developer-led projects for components and user-led projects for applications, we can quickly look at open source project life cycles, which ta-da, is exactly the same uh, or similar to products. Um, the only difference, because it's, again, as I said early on, an open source project is not a traditional project with an end date set, but rather behaves more like a product, meaning it is conceived at some point of time, grows, matures, may eventually decline and die. But unlike a closed source product, that death is not necessarily permanent. There might be a revival because it's open source software. Um, and it probably lives on much longer than closed source products because as long as they are users, they can maintain the software. So the time duration left to right here is longer uh, than in the common open, a common closed source product. What happens now with open source is that it's driving innovation from the bottom up. It is not killing innovation. Um, so companies can still innovate, often also with closed source software. But if any of those innovating companies become so dominant that it's eating into the margin of all other companies, they will, these other companies, IT companies, are likely to create a developer-led product, a project components that will um, uh, eat up or try to replace said application or component that is leading the market simply because they don't want to see their margins eroded. So open source keeps innovation, keeps, inno, 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 keeps any innovator on their toes because there's the constant threat that your innovation will get commoditized by a competing open source project if you overdo it with your license fees. So we can see basically uh, a bottom-up commoditization, a wave behind the innovation wave that is ensuring by way of open source strategy that is ensuring that uh, it's much harder uh, to build, uh, to lock in people badly forever into your products. Of course, everything is more complicated in real life than in my simple illustrations, but open source is a potent means of, of avoiding vendor lock-in. That's it from me for today. Thank you very much for your time and attention and see you in the next session.